and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is LaCroix Meadows and I am a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and I also serve as the Director of OSU Extension Franklin County. It is such a pleasure to see everyone here today. So now let's get on to today's forum. The title of our forum is Afrocentric Education is All About Us. It is sponsored by the Robert Weiler Company and Columbus City Schools, which are both represented here today. So won't you please help me to thank them. Thank you so much. Education is a process of harnessing and guiding inner potential. Thus an awareness of one's identity is a critical foundation of learning. Afrocentric education cultivates a strong cultural identity for students by immersing them in African traditions, rituals, values, and symbols. By strengthening identity, we provide better learning outcomes for individuals which result in a stronger community for us all. Let's explore these issues. Please join me in welcoming our experts, the Hazel C. Youngberg Trustees Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of African American and African Studies at The Ohio State University, Dr. Simone Drake. Secondly, we have the Director of the Columbus Afrocentric Early College, Todd Walker. We also have the Chair of the English Department at Columbus State Community College, Robin Lyons Robinson. And last but not least, our host for this afternoon is the founder of Artfluential and the 2018 Sankofa Emerging Leader Awardee, Mr. Marshall Shorts. Marshall, the stage is yours. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. How y'all doing today? All right, um, so good afternoon. It's an honor to be here uh, along with these distinguished scholars on stage. Um, as I prepared uh, for today's panel and my nerves began to set in, uh, I began to ask myself a lot of questions. Um, mainly, did I really understand and know um, what Afrocentric education was? Um, I am by no means an expert. Um, uh, of Af Afrocentric education models or pedagogy, um, and I, li I like to say that word because um, it makes me sound smarter than I really am, uh, and I don't often get to use it, so I'm gonna use it today. Um, but as I research various um, journals and articles and essays to better understand uh, what Afrocentric pedagogy is, um, I came across a number of different definitions, um, but the one that I, s I found that was, uh, I think, really uh, key for today's discussion, um, says Afrocentric education is defined as the adoption of Afrocentric ideology and cultural relevancy uh, for use within classrooms. Uh, proponents believe it should be a part of any effort to educate black children. As a result, um, these teachers and educators are armed with necessary tools to advocate for a more authentic education for black children. Um, so I began to reflect on my academic experience in my formidable years, um, growing up in inner city Cleveland, attending a public magnet school called Cleveland School of the Arts, and um, thinking about, you know, was that an Afrocentric education uh, in, in experience? Not necessarily um, overtly, but um, it was a 90 plus percent school of uh, black children, um, our, our staff was predominantly black. And so inherently in our education and our daily cultural practices um, was a black uh, experience. And so as we begin the discussion about uh, what an Afrocentric education is, um, although my experience was not sort of an overt political statement uh, around Afrocentricity out of the 60s, um, it was a black experience and predominantly um, sort of enthralled by people of African descent. Um, so um, another quote from an article that I read, um, and then we'll open up this discussion, um, says, according to Afrocentric philosophy, African Americans in the United States can only be properly understood when both African cultural and Western hemispheric political realities are taken into account together. 
Um, and so considering these things and my experience um, and the impact that that had for me and my ability to kind of see futures and community and affirmations of experiences of people who look like me here in the United States um, and in the African diaspora, uh, I believe um, I really had an Afrocentric experience based on that definition. So I want to kind of open it up for discussion so we can get right into it to the panelists. But I want to start by asking, um, considering that some people in the audience may not have a definitive definition of what that is, by asking the panelists, and you can expound on it however you wish or in no particular order, how would you define an Afrocentric education and why you are a proponent or not a proponent of this model? Well, I guess I will. <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, thank you for uh, having us uh, here. I see so many supporters, uh, both from Columbus City Schools and uh, more uh, in, in a nearer sense uh, to me on a daily basis, Columbus Afrocentric, those that are part of our site-based council. Um, when, when you think about uh, what it means to be African-centered, usually African-centered education speaks to the pedagogical process, the educational processes, whereas Afrocentric is a perspective. Uh, our vision at Columbus Afrocentric is high achievement early college for each student as we affirm, and, and this is where I think is critically important to the dialogue today, the positive leadership of African Americans to benefit the global community. And I like the, uh, the way that the conversation has been framed in terms of it being all about us. Uh, because us, to me, is not, uh, does not just speak to African Americans, it speaks to uh, all humans. And the way that we approach uh, African-centered education at Columbus Afrocentric is not just for African-American students, that the benefit of knowing the contributions of African-Americans is, is benefits all of us. Uh, and that we are all more well off when we are more well informed about what those actual contributions have been. Uh, the reason why we need an, an African-centered education or a concept called Afrocentricity is because, as most of us know of the historical uh, process, particularly in America, uh, of segregation and, and racism that has uh, much maligned um, the, the concept of what it means to be an African American. Uh, there's disinformation, misinformation, uh, and lacking information about what the meaningful contributions of, of those from the African diaspora have made to the global community. And so we, what we are uh, about is, is a process of rehabilitation. Uh, both for African Americans and for the broader community in terms of understanding uh, the efficacy of and, and the capacity that we all have as, as members of the, of the human family, uh, which includes those of African descent. And just to piggyback on that, um, I also agree that the students that are attending Afrocentric or Afrocentric educations have so much to give back to uh, the rest of us. Um, with Columbus State's partnership with Columbus Afrocentric, uh, I was directly involved with those students in the classroom and working with them. I was the Columbus State representative for the English classes they were taking, and so the students, we started working with them as early as ninth grade, and um, we're still working with them, and it might be under a different umbrella now, but our teachers are saying that these students, they bring so much more to our Columbus State classrooms. So our Columbus State students are learning from the students who have this knowledge and this information that most of them have never been exposed to um, coming from more of a Eurocentric uh, educational experience. So definitely I feel also that there is a need for um, an Afrocentric perspective in learning for all of us. And if the way to get that started is to start when they're in kindergarten, I'm all for it. I guess I can speak for more of the higher education perspective. And you know, my my department at Ohio State, African American and African Studies, is is not an Afrocentric focused department. There are such departments. Temple University, probably the most famously, um, with Malefe Asante founding um, that department, and also this sort of ideology of Afrocentricity. Um, and, but then you also have other sort of twists on that, um, Africology, which is at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so, they, but my department 
in all departments, kind of they came out of protests during the late 60s, early 70s. And I would, I would say that, you know, one thing that we currently struggle with that in some degree is about centering, um, although I, I think there, there's no way to, to do that, the kind of work that we do without having a very global perspective that is both Western and non-Western. Um, but the kind of something that we wrestle with now is when black studies departments were being, and programs were being formed around the country in the 60s and, se and 70s, and then the ones that came on later in the 80s and 90s, it was in response to the lack of um, work on the African American experience or on the global black experience in the traditional existing academic units. Um, and so one thing that we have to contend with now as a department is that many of those units now do do this work. Um, and so then the question arises, kind of where does African American African studies in, in regards to my department still fit into kind of institutional structures? Right? When, when you begin to start having repetition, when in sociology, political science, English history, these departments that were not doing this work at the time of our founding are now doing it as well. And so what is it that we do that might be different or how is it that we do it um, that distinguishes it from, from these other disciplines or how might we work together with them? Right? So those are some of the things that we have to work with kind of around um, around ideologies that, 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 that do frame blackness and an investment in um, incorporating that into intellectual thought. Thank you, thank you. Um, Simone, you spoke to uh, the inception of Afrocentricity um, out of the 60s in that era. Um, what, what was sort of the, the, the conditions that uh, brought this about and um, as a, as, and then used as an a educational tool in schools and higher ed. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we know in general, like the 60s and black people. Um, <laughs> but you know, particularly in the educational setting, um, why, why is, I guess, why is Afrocentricity a thing in education um, now? And that's to anybody on the panel, but. I, I would, one thing I would say is that that, that was birthed a bit later. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, very early on, even before this, the 60s, 70s, um, there were ideologies around Pan-Africanism from like the 19th century. Um, that, that, and so you, you saw some of that kind of global focus during the black power movement, during the civil rights movement, um, with interest in black people's experiences globally, and then sometimes also other um, kind of uh, marginalized groups. Right, and not not just um, people of African descent. With and and I'm not and I, because I this is not my area of expertise actually um, Afrocentricity. Um, I can't say that I can say all of this definitively. But but if you're talking about somebody like Asante, I mean he did not start publishing on this topic until the 80s and into the 90s. Um, so it isn't really what framed the the discipline of of Black Studies. Um, it was more of the, the ac academic, political, intellectual, um, historical, cultural representations of black people's experiences um, from contact with the Western world to through the transatlantic slave trade and, um, and then also a, another arm which was social responsibility, right? How do you engage the community? How, um, how do you get this information beyond and outside of the academy? Um, so the, the, these more kind of niche, I think, sort of ideologies developed as the discipline was evolving. And, um, and then you started seeing d different directions that different groups went. Okay. Any other panelists want to? I, I would probably add to that that um, I heard a quote this week. Uh, there's a poet, she's just come out with a book, um, Morgan Parker. and she was being interviewed on NPR, one of the things that she said uh, was that she writes about black women and bodies and um, how we are performing at all times, even when that's not what we're conscious of doing. And she had a quote that said, um, my body is an argument that I did not start. And that just kind of rang with me. And I think 
particularly uh, children of color, African American kids, um, need to understand that because that's the reality that they live in. And so if their education can incorporate that kind of um, critical thinking about how they exist in the world, um, that, that gives them the uh, agency and advocacy to uh, secede. And so uh, right now at Columbus State, we're just starting to think in terms of what can we do to support uh, students of color, particularly African-American uh, male students. There's a, we see an increasing gap in their achievement. And so um, their first year of college, uh, our goal is for all of our students to finish their first 15 credit hours their first year of college. Um, and we see that with African-American males, they're, they're missing the mark. And it's, it's decreasing, decreasing from year to year. And we're asking, what can we do to solve that? And I think we, might, we need to be looking at, well, who's, who's successful with our African-American males when it comes to educating them? Is it the, uh, and are those successful places? Is it our HBCUs? Is it our, um, K through 12 programs that have an Afrocentric focus. So I think, um, I, I happen to believe that there is something that they're doing. Uh, we all know that the majority of um, doctors, engineers, attorneys, uh, college graduates, um, in terms of African Americans, are coming out of our HBCUs. And so we might need to be looking at what is it that they're doing that the rest of us can mimic. Mm -hmm. And so I would add um, that I think part of, part of the work that we do in education is, is the social emotional. It's not, it's not just uh, the, you know, obviously we're teaching uh, math, we're teaching chemistry, we're teaching English, uh, but the self-concept that students bring uh, to their learning impacts how well they think they can learn. And we know that, um, that students, uh, and there's all sorts of literature that talks about the belief gap and, and, and how students are impacted um, um, by particularly uh, uh, students, uh, disproportionately students of color, uh, and, and some of this is correlated with, with socioeconomic status, by um, how, the, how the folks that are in front of them uh, feel about them and emote about them and, and quote unquote believe uh, in them or what they believe about them. Uh, and I think part of that is because of this notion of self-concept and again, this idea of, of, of needing uh, an African-centered approach, I, I think really emerges from um, where we have found ourselves in terms of uh, how uh, as a rationalization for, for slavery, uh, we, we, we mythologized uh, all sorts of, of wrong ideas about uh, who African uh, and African Americans are. And, and so now uh, there's a rehabilitation that needs to take place. Uh, and, and Carter G. Woodson, who started uh, what was first Negro Education Week and then become black, became Black History Month, is famous for saying that if you control a man's mind, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to tell him to stand there or sit there. You don't have to tell him to go to the back door. Uh, and, and, he, and he talks about how um, if you don't, even if you don't tell him to go, he will go there of his own free will and volition. Why? Because his education makes it necessary. And so education in that sense is, is, is broader, right, than, than how uh, we oftentimes think of it, but I think it becomes important, particularly for this conversation, that when we're looking at our, our youth, that all students right, need the adults that are in front of them to believe in them. But there is a particular um, sort of cultural conversation that we are combating when it comes to our African American youth. And, and part of our task at Columbus Afrocentric is uh, to teach students to become critical consumers of uh, the cultural information in, in, in which we are all situated. Uh, because some of that information is, is helpful and some of it is not. And so how do you process messaging uh, in such a way that uh, it, 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 allow, it, it, it encourages you and inspires you and, and moves you in a positive direction rather than causing you to stagnate 
or regress? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I hope y'all getting your questions ready. Uh, we'll be getting audience questions here in a few minutes. Um, to your point, uh, as I think about my experience, I always, you know, I'm a firm believer that exposure is a doorway to possibility. And so um, just optically uh, being in a space, uh, and, and my school was fourth grade through 12th grade. Um, and so being in a space where uh, people of African descent were uh, celebrated on a daily basis beyond Black History Month um, paved the way for me as a creative entrepreneur of the possibility um, that I could do that. Um, and so when I left that environment and went to a predominantly white uh, college, uh, which was a very sort of culture shock for me, um, it was that foundation that kind of, you know, pushed me through um, and, and gave me the affirmation. I could always recall that experience and know that there was a Gordon Parks that was successful. There was a Ella Fitzgerald, there was a Colin Powell, um, even, and even, you know, uh, people on the continent um, that were successful. We were taught about those things early on. And so when you come into contact with um, something that is foreign to you, I think is very important. Um, so I want to get a couple more questions in before we open it up to the audience. Um, I really want to know um, beyond how, how can Afrocentric education um, be enveloped by people who aren't necessarily um, people we would consider Afrocentric people. You know what I mean? So how can this live beyond just black students, and how can mainstream education adopt some of these principles in a non-appropriation or appropriative way? Um, where it's authentic, can it be authentic, um, and can these things be instituted in sort of a mainstream model of education um, so that there's cultural competency not just amongst uh, black students and students of color, but amongst all students who come in contact with this information? We can start with reading list. <laughs> uh, just going from my discipline, um, and I think to Simone's point, I think you, we do see that um, educators, uh, particularly at the college level, are making a greater effort to make sure that their uh, reading lists are more diverse. Um, but at the same time, uh, it also requires a meeting of the minds with those who um, can speak to the experiences. So even though you may be teaching Toni Morrison's Blue Eye, how have you prepared yourself to do that? Um, have you... Uh, collaborated or interacted or uh, studied with um, experts and, and have you read the uh, the research and the scholarship so that what you are teaching about Toni Morrison and her works is not contributing to the miseducation um, that uh, Dr. Walker is speaking of. And it's one of the things that is kind of uh, we particularly with um, the College Credit Plus programming that we have, so that students are able to take college level courses as young as 12 years old, okay? So um, imagine your 12 year old could be taking a, a class at Columbus State or Ohio State or Otterbein and sitting next, next to um, you know, a, a, an African American a woman who's had a world of experience. And so, what does that dialogue and that conversation look like, even if your reading list represents um, the diversity that we're all seeking and, and the Afrocentric perspectives? And so, there's lots of questions that I think we're still needing to talk about, dialogue about, and think about um, because it, I get lots of calls from parents. <laughs> um, so, I, we, may, we need to step back and, and get everyone um, on the same page when it comes to uh, Afrocentric education and its value and how it needs to be delivered depending on the audience. I guess I would like to add, and probably partly because of how I'm trained, like language is something that I'm a real stickler for and defining of terms. And so Afrocentric, Afrocentric, um, diversity and inclusion, what I, what I describe as what I do, critical race and gender studies, I think that they're all quite distinctively different. Um, and so, I, um, and at least my background with Afrocentricity is that it, it's, it's more than simply centering the black experience. It, it's, it's, it's a very um, 
historically, culturally rooted in Africa itself. And, and that, is, that is different than simply making sure that you have inclusion and representation in your curriculum. Um, it, it's it's a, a particular type of methodology of, of both doing research and instruction. And so I, I think that that's important. So, you know, from my perspective of doing critical race and gender studies, of, of course, I think it benefits all. Um, it, you know, it, it, will, it will look specifically at the way in which people of African descent, for me, primarily in the Americas, negotiate and work with sort of the, the political systems um, and the histories in which they embody in the United States and um, often um, in other parts of the Americas. But that is not the same as an, as, um, an Afrocentric approach. Um, that, and so I think, I think that distinction is important, as, as well as uh, like the distinction between segregation and separatism. Right? Segregation is imposed, separatism is by choice. Right? So to, depending on the kind of logistics of how your school was developed and, and how you ended up there, it very well might have been a separatist experience right, with parents choosing, as opposed to one in which um, by district lines or various other means were segregated. And, and I think that that's, I, I think it's always very important when people are making choices and why they're making those choices. And as, as far back as 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, a prominent sociologist, he said that if black people, for their, particularly for educating their children, that integration was a great idea. But if the students weren't going to be in a space where they could feel safe, where they received sympathy, love, kindness from their teachers, then separatism was better until you could get to that point. And so I think for me, like language matters a lot and, and thinking about sort of the nuance between all of these terms that might on their face sound very similar, but, but in fact can, can actually be quite different. Thank you. And, and, and I would say um, in, in alignment with, with both uh, the, uh, the comments of the other panelists that, that we have to be patient with each other. Uh, and, and I think patience is important because in that there's a recognition that e even uh, within those that espouse Afrocentricity uh, or critical race uh, theory or other uh, ideological concepts that purport to talk about the African, African American experience, there was a, there was a wide degree of differentiation. Um, and, and so uh, part of, uh, of the task that, uh, that I face in particular in coming to Afrocentric is, is, in, is in settling on how we were going to think about this. Uh, and, and so for, for us, um, to your question, Marshall, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is very important that uh, the work uh, of African-centered education is not just with African-American either instructors or even with students. Uh, that is, it is inclusive and not exclusive. Uh, because of the fact that um, in, in how we are conceptualizing it, 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 is, more, it is more about a, a recognition of, of the contribution and the capacity that all of us as part of a human family bring uh, to the fabric of society. And it does begin, uh, to Dr. Drake's point, in, uh, in Africa, uh, but uh, from a uh, bio, uh, biological and linguistic standpoint, humanity emerged from Africa. And so it is not a contradiction uh, for us to talk about in the context of the human experience what the contributions of geographic Africa have been uh, in concert with uh, those of Europe, those of Asia, uh, Polynesia, and other parts of the world. Uh, the problem, as I see it, is that historically that has not been done. Uh, the first black studies class that I took was when I attended uh, The Ohio State University. Prior to that, I, my, my education was, was very uh, uh, it, it, typical of probably most people in this room, Western-centered. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's more than that. And so uh, part of the recognition of, of how, how, how we are choosing to, to promote the Afrocentric is an intentionally uh, including and, and focusing on 
uh, what those contributions of historical Africa have been and, and how those contributions validate not only the existence of African Americans and the capacity of African Americans today, but how they speak to the capacity of the whole human family uh, as, as it relates to uh, how we move forward together. Thank you. And I also want to mention that when we talk about Africa, it's, it's not a country, it's a continent, um, and has a lot of diversity within the, and within the continent. It has its own set of uh, history of conflict and, and unity. Um, so as we talk about Afrocentricity, let's you know, keep that in mind and keep that in context uh, about the, the, the totality of, of an African experience um, on the continent and beyond. Um, so uh, we will be moving to audience questions in just a few minutes. Uh, if you have a question, we have a microphone right over there next to the Columbus Metropolitan sign. Um, you can begin to line up there um, as we get a final thought from the panelists. Um, and I want to kind of bring this back to Columbus. Um, and and I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Walker. Um, how have programs like the burgeoning connection between Columbus Afrocentric Early College and Columbus State College work to strengthen um, ongoing education um, in your school, but how can that sort of be replicated in other Columbus City schools um, that aren't necessarily Afri African-centered? And please, don't be shy. Uh, have questions, and you can make your way over there right now. Well, well I, I would first say that I think it is replicated. I, I don't think, um, and as a matter of fact, I know that we are not the only school that is fostering uh, these connections with colleges and universities. Um, what is now more broadly known, er, the early college model as it was first conceptualized was focused specifically on uh, underrepresented uh, populations and, and disadvantaged uh, populations as it relates to higher education outcomes. Uh, and that was in the early, in Ohio at least, in the early 2000s, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, was instrumental in pushing a lot of that work forward nationwide. Uh, what has since happened with College Credit Plus is that uh, the opportunity for students to experience uh, the, the college uh, coursework uh, in high school or sometime, in some cases earlier uh, is, has been made available to, to students uh, in every high school. Uh, what I, I think is, is, was critical and is still remains critical for, um, for our work at, at Columbus Afrocentric as an early college is the support element uh, because much of our, our work focuses, focuses on students who are first generation and uh, or, or who are part of those of that underrepresented population. So the, the, the critical conversation be, becomes for me, how do we support them in this trans, transition? The, the reason for early college is that how do we begin to not only make college more affordable by giving students the opportunity to earn college credit while they're in high school, but how do we also create a, a supportive context for them to begin to experience college and all the nuances that, that go along with it. Uh, because for people who were either first generation college students themselves, uh, or even if you weren't, and knew folks that were, uh, there are many things that go along with the college education uh, that are ancillary, but critically important to matriculating uh, and to, to getting a college degree. Uh, and the, the, the data around uh, where we struggle, and there's been, there's a lot of work uh, that is good work that's being done in increasing those outcomes, both at Ohio State. Uh, I know Dr. James Moore, who's a friend of mine, does really great work with, with African American males. There are, there are others uh, that, that are increasing uh, outcomes for, for African Americans, but, but, but we need to continue to look at that work, and we need to continue to look at how do we push that work earlier uh, in, in middle school. In, in high school and, and even earlier than that. Um, so that so that students are prepared for the rigor of the work because they might be able to pass a placement test, uh, but the college experience is more than just passing that placement test. You have to understand the pace of the work. You have to have access to, uh, to, to educational resources um, and because there's submissions that, that need to take place. So there's a whole, uh, you know, a panoply of things that, that that go along with this, and I think that 
Um, you know, that work has been going on at, at Columbus Afrocentric before I came there, I, I, you know, but there's, there's a need to continue to do that work, uh, both in CCP and in early college models that focus more on first generation uh, underrepresented populations. Thank you. Did anybody else want to, before we open um, it up to the audience? We, and since the early 2000s, Columbus State has been um, working with um, teachers at uh, Columbus Afrocentric, and we just need more of that, and we, we need more support um, in terms of resources, technology, access to technology is uh, often a major barrier for uh, your, your rural, uh, your uh, urban, uh, we're seeing urban um, high schools and and so much of the college education these days is online or it's digitized. I mean, we're moving toward textbooks no longer being books that you and I came up with. They are, they're digital. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of making sure that students are not only academically prepared, we call it college readiness. Are they there? Are, do we have them ready to take that placement exam? And if we don't, what do we have in place for them so that uh, we're looking at some of the non-cognitive needs that they may have and looking at multiple majors for uh, deciding whether or not they're ready to take that first college level writing course or math course. And so we're doing a lot, um, at least at Columbus State, in terms of offering co-requisite uh, courses so that they can take a college level class at the same time they're taking more of a support class to help get them through. And so that's something that um, we're making, we're being more intentional about in terms of closing those gaps. Thank you. And, and right before we open it up to the you can make your way to the mic. Um, Columbus City Schools does have a mentoring program. So even though if you're not an educator, you can get involved and that is uh, really important. Um, in the development of our, our village in Columbus. So um, it's the CMC tradition to take questions from the audience. So as you step to the mic to ask your question, please state your name and ask a question. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you can have a comment, but please end it with a question. Uh, you, we we want to remember questions with a question mark. So uh, you got to put that rule once. If I, I didn't say it up, enough, right? uh, a question. Uh, but please yes. proceed. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. My name's Nicole Makeda, and I guess I had a concern that I was going to phrase in some type of way for question. Now, so my mind is spinning. But I think my concern is as I was listening. This isn't sounding new, it's not sounding fresh, it doesn't sound like we're really trying to stay current. The 60s were 60 years ago. And I think my concern is, as I was listening, I thought about the James Baldwin quote, where he said to be, and I'm gonna paraphrase, to be a, a Negro and relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. And so my concern is, if we're just educating young people to better understand themselves and then kind of leaving it there and not addressing the wider society that they live in and the lack of opportunities, are we really just setting them up to just be frustrated? Um, and, and so my concern is I feel that we need to start revising our strategy. I understand the importance of focusing on the student getting to be a better person. And I like to look at it as the seed versus the soil kind of analogy. The students are the seeds and they need to be stronger seeds. But I think I really implore everybody in the room to understand that it's really about the soil and that's really where the work is. It's in the environments that we're sending these babies to. That It's really about power and I just don't feel that an Afrocentric education as much as it does for us as a person it doesn't empower us so I guess I'm going to make my question now what are your thoughts about how are we going to empower all of these Afrocentric babies that we're pushing out into the world who care about themselves how are we going to engage the larger community to understand how important it is and how that's a plus that this child has this understanding of who they are versus being subservient, because it shows up differently. We have warriors now, and they're showing up in the workplace differently. What are we doing to make sure that all this education that we're giving them is helping to lift them up and not make them further depressed? I, I guess I always like to think of education as uplifting. I mean, it, it is the more knowledge that you gain, I think the, the actually the more free you become. Um, but I also don't necessarily believe in blueprints. 
Um, I think you have to kind of carve out and forge the way that works for, for you. Um, and a lot of my work does focus on agency or being agentic and, and how do you, um, how people are, or how do you kind of work to um, see yourself differently and so perhaps that's part of what the education provides is a way to see yourself differently but then what do you do with it and I don't think there's a blueprint for that I, I think that that is individualistic and you can have people who advocate and support you but you have to figure out what it is that you want to do and then how to go about it how to find the um, how to reach out when you need resources to do it but um, and perhaps this also comes from kind of the feminist gender studies background for me is empowering is a, is a tricky word. Um, it, it, it means that somebody has to give you permission and um, has to grant you that power. I, I believe in taking it, so. Uh, I, I think, um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, one, you know, it, it, as much as things have changed, I think in certain, to a certain respect, things have not. Uh, you have authors like ta Coates, Coates, uh, who, who many widely consider to be the new James Baldwin, so to speak, if you can have one, um, that, that speaks uh, with perhaps equal force to the experience of the African-American male uh, in a very visceral, uh, real way, um, capturing what that looks like. I think for me, in, in terms of impacting systems, because that's when I hear, when I, when I heard that question, I heard there, there's, there, are, there are structural and, and, and systematic issues um, that, that impact the work that we do. Um, and, and my view on that is that, uh, that's, that systems are made up of people, and that it, it, it only takes one person to go into a system to begin to transform. The analogy could be that of salt and light. Uh, when you eat, uh, something, whether it's the, the, the meatloaf that we had today or chicken or whatever it is, uh, and it has the presence of salt, uh, you know that it's there. Uh, you don't say, man, this chicken sure tastes, uh, or you don't say this salt sure tastes chickeny. You say, <laughs> this chicken sure tastes salty. You don't say, this salt sure tastes meatloafy. You say, the meatloaf is salty. And so it's the presence of the students that we empower and transport and infuse into these systems that I think have the capacity. This is my hope uh, as, as an educator that uh, it only takes one. Uh, because anyone who's taught knows that sometimes you feel like you may be only reaching one uh, on any given day. And so in, in order to stay encouraged, that, that, that I think is a healthy perspective. And I think it rings true. Um, you look at historically people who have transformed uh, the world. We recently celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday uh, and others. There's, there's folks lesser known, uh, Benjamin Elijah Mays, who uh, though he doesn't have the renown that Martin Luther King did, uh, he was the president of, of Morehouse for a number of years and, and is widely considered one of Martin Luther King's mentors. And many people don't know of him, but it was his ideas that often we heard in Dr. King's speeches. And so you never know. Uh, you know, and I'm even surprised now, many of my students that I've taught are in their 30s now, uh, how uh, what you say and you, or what you have done as an educator or as a mentor or as a person who, who is interacting with youth or people in general, how those things impact. And then how that person then carries that into the space where they are, whether it's a, uh, the arts and entertainment, business, congregation, family, education, direct media, government, wherever it is that people are, there's an opportunity for impact. Um. You have? Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. I, I think that's a question for the room, though. Um, I think empowering is a responsibility for all of us, not just the educators um, in the schools, but as a community, we need to mobilize and organize to empower our youth as they come out into the community um, and be a productive citizen. So that's my input, uh, Dr. Crum. Hello. Um, like Dr. Walker said, my first your, your black... name. Oh, sorry, Melissa Crum. <laughs> Um, like Dr. Walker said, my first uh, black studies course was also at Ohio State, um, which is, again, telling of how many of our K-12 uh, curriculum works. Uh, but also thinking about um, uh, when I taught at Ohio State and was teaching a, a black studies course and knowing how great our Buckeyes are, going to uh, Marshall's point, still conceptualizing Africa as a country and just, just geographically. that that's 
that's a problem, right? So just really thinking about how that might shift in general when we're um, centering uh, Afrocentric or uh, African people. But my question is thinking about uh, your potential detractors, detract, potential detractors of Afrocentric uh, education. And so I'm wondering, when we're thinking about um, this incorporation of mainstream, which oftentimes when we say that, it's just kind of like code word for like uh, your people of European ancestry, right? So when we're thinking about incorporating um, white students or making it um, whatever we mean by inclusive, do we think that project looks more like um, trying to normalize Afrocentric thought as just another American experience, so people can see that as just another option for thinking about um, American and a larger global uh, perspectives, or do we see that more about trying to make it more palatable for white students so they don't feel some type of erasure, which is not, that's not what it does, but we can see how that might happen. I'll try it again. So, thinking <laughs> well, yeah. about thinking about is, is when we're thinking about potential detractors, is when we're thinking about how do we incorporate white students into an Afrocentric lens in edu an Afrocentric education? Are we? Do you find that you have to advocate for trying to explain how Afrocentric education is just another way of thinking about American experience? It's not necessarily an erasure of white students and how they may see themselves. Yeah, I mean, and we, we have a few uh, uh, students that are, are, are not African American at, uh, at Columbus Afrocentric. And, and our approach is the same. You know, for, for me, uh, the, the, the emphasis uh, at, at Columbus Afrocentric Early College is both uh, an African-centered approach and uh, early college. Uh, a desire for early college, and so um, I don't think, to your point about erasure, I, I don't, I don't think that you have to water anything down. I think facts speak for themselves, uh, because for me, much of the much of the issue um, was a, just a lack of knowledge, and I think that's what even we still grapple with is most people just you don't know. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, and then uh, what, what happens is, some, is sometimes we, we, uh, we become connected uh, to, to a way of thinking about something that, that may not be true. And so then you have this, this, this experience where uh, when you're confronted with new information, you have to make some decisions about how does this fit into uh, the, the structure of the other ideas that I have incorporated into my thinking. I think this is very much an adult uh, educational process as much as it is a process for, for our students. Um, but I think a, a, a healthy perspective is I, I start with the human family, that there's one human race, the human race, with diverse ethnicities. And I think if you start there, it keeps it healthy. Uh, and then what you can say is, yes, they're, they're one, of, one of these expressions that is unique and has unique attributes and, 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 and influences and, and adds a unique spice to the hu human family is, uh, it, it can be African-centered or, or from, from continental Africa, from the experiences of Africans. And you look across the world, and, and those are very unique, uh, from, from music uh, to, uh, to scholarship to um, uh, culinary arts, there's a wide variety of, of, of different aspects of life that we can look at as being influenced by um, African culture, whether we're talking about a, a, the continent in general, which is difficult to do, as, as several have pointed out, or a specific country in Africa. Uh, I think that, that is where, that is what has been missing to me. And when you insert that back into the equation, it doesn't detract from anyone. It doesn't, doesn't erase who you are. It, 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 if we do it right, uh, it should really build capacity for a broader understanding uh, that, that helps us to interact in, in ways that are, that are healthier. Thank you. Um, we got a couple of more minutes, so I want to get these last two questions in. Um, if, if we can have you both ask your questions and the panel can address both of, both of them at the same time. And those will be the last two questions for audience. Um, Kay Wilson, so in talking about uh, 
Afrocentric education. So I have the opportunity to serve with Impact Community Action and working with youth that are currently um, incarcerated in the juvenile detention facility. And I struggle sometimes because we have obviously young people of color are the majority and want to know how do you see or do you see the importance of infusing Afrocentric education in that particular community as having them both help understand themselves and understand um, the importance of education through a particular lens. Thank you. Nicole Madison, um, Dr. Lyons Robinson mentioned in her comments something about the outcomes of HBCU graduates um, on a very positive note. And I was thinking about how we still have a lot of pervasive perceptions of an HBCU and or an Afrocentric education being less than. And so I just wondered how do we change that conversation and perception? And I am a graduate of an HBCU, so I do not believe that they are less than. I'll pick up on that one. Um, I, I was lucky and fortunate enough, I think I kind of, I had a, experiences in, in different realms. So I think for, as for most um, African-American children, uh, your, your formative years, maybe uh, during preschool years, you're probably uh, being educated in a, in a private home care environment, which is very nurturing, and you may go to a, 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 a preschool that, that's, uh, you don't have to, there's it's probably gonna be uh, people that look like you teaching you and, and sitting next to you and all of that. And then I, I too shifted into a um, predominantly white neighborhood and predominantly white school. But then when I, my freshman year of college, I was at Howard. So I, I got a taste of that. And uh, with it being an HBCU, it was just like, whoa, it was culture shock. And I think we were all in culture shock. Um, and then I uh, transferred to OSU. And, I think that, yeah, that was another transition, right? And they were all valuable experiences, but I think to your point is, one of the things that I did when I was teaching an African-American literature course is I made one of the assignments to have the students um, at Columbus State uh, research HBCUs, and most of them had never even heard of that acronym. What is that? And they went out and they researched it, and they actually interviewed graduates of HBCUs, and they got a taste of, or they, I, they learned more about, there's a different way of experiencing higher education, and this is how some people think about us, or think about their lives, and so it, op it opened things up. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah, I think that it, it, there is much to be learned from that experience, and we need to maybe be interacting more or collaborating more with some of our HBCUs, many of which are right here in the state of Ohio. And if there could be partnerships, uh, uh, integrated programs, those types of things. Thank you. Um, I guess to, to the question about um, incarcerated youth and, and educational, um, I guess, access as well as perspectives, I, I certainly think that um, that, that a knowledge of the black experience um, can, can be really important. Um, but I, I mean, I, I majored in classics and English, and I didn't see classics being a world of different from when I then did a master's in black studies. Um, so the, when, it, when, when you think about it in regards to how you produce knowledge, what counts as knowledge, and, and so I think that the two can go together. So like, for example, my, I have three sons, um, when they had to sit at home for three days when there was no school. The middle schooler, I had him read Jason Reynolds, an African-American young adult writer. The high schooler, I had him read Tolstoy. Um, and I, I think that it was, and he had already read Jason Reynolds. I think it was important that they, that, they, that they were exposed to both of those. And I think that, you know, particularly if you're talking about penal systems, Tolstoy can be quite important um, for thinking about um, fascist regimes and things like that. So um, I just think knowledge, all forms of knowledge are really actually very empowering. And, um, and I think a lot of times people who are, end up in those spaces and confined, um, 
that it, it that it's even more critical that they have access to knowledge and, and I'm not really restrictive about what that kind of knowledge might be. Well, I hate to do this. Of course, when the conversation gets mm -hmm. meaty, it's always time to stop. So I'm going to turn this over back to the presiding officer of the day um, so they can close us out. Thank you so much. What a rich discussion. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you. I too am a graduate of an HBCU, so thank you for noting that it is important to partner with these institutions. Um, I would not be standing here if it was not for Tennessee State University. Please join me in thanking our sponsors, the Robert Weiler Company. Thank you so much. Thank you. As well as our friends at Columbus City Schools. Thank you so much. And also join me in welcome, thanking our speakers, Dr. Simone Drake, Dr. Todd Walker, Robin Lyons Robinson, and our own Marshall Shorts. And again, thanks to all of you for being here today. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great afternoon.